Well, hello, my name is Gordon Palmer, I'm minister here at Clement Parish Church, and this is our service for Sunday, July the 25th. Welcome to you all. Um, I think it's Anna Weir that's uh, doing the signing um, this week. We've been um, following in a series in the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel. In, in the series, we're not covering chapter 18, but in that chapter, um, God speaking to uh, his people through Ezekiel says this, for I, I, for I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Therefore, repent and live. That call of, to repent and live is a call based on the fact that God loves first, based on the fact that God is a God of grace. Only b by grace can we enter. So let us pray, and we will gather up our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the words for the prayer will be on the screen. Let us pray. God, you're the one who's at the beginning, the one who is the end, the one who is before and behind, the God of everything that is. We haven't words to describe your greatness. We haven't wor words to explain your fullness. And we haven't words to describe the depth of your love and your graciousness. You're a God who didn't keep all of that to yourself. And how we thank you for coming to us in Jesus, walking dusty roads, washing tired feet, feeding hungry minds, and not forgetting the empty stomachs. So, we approach you looking to be fed, to be nourished, to be made strong, to wonder and worship and adore, that we all might grow in gifts and grace and offer you glory through Christ. We thank you, too, for the wonder and the gift of the Holy Spirit, so that you're not just a God that we hear of or hear about, but one that we know with us and one who helps us day by day. We thank you for the gifts that the Spirit gives. We thank you for the fruitfulness that the Spirit grows of Christ in our lives. And yet we also confess to you, Holy God, that we've not always followed the Spirit's leading, we've not always followed the example of Jesus, that too often we've opted for the short term, 
and have neither the vision nor patience to work for the things that last. Too often we doubt your presence, we drown in anxiety, or head off on a road leading nowhere. Too often we hold back from struggle and we think that comfort and ease is something that we're entitled to. Gracious God, forgive us. And forgive us and allow us to know that pardon, that fellowship with you restored. And help us to trust in your constant, faithful, forgiving, renewing grace in Christ. In whose name we pray. And in whose words we gather up our prayers. Our Father. <laughs> We are continuing in our series on the Old Testament prophet of uh, Ezekiel. Uh, we've looked already at a couple of the visions that he was given to, while he was in exile in Babylon, assuring him of God's presence with him there. And then, more soberingly, last week in chapter 8, the vision that he saw of the, the Lord departing or beginning his departure from Jerusalem as a judgment on his people because they hadn't been faithful. And now we're moving on to uh, chapter 16. And Ezekiel begins that by saying, The word of the Lord came to me. So listen for the word of God. Ezekiel chapter 16, I'm going to read the first 14 verses, um, and then I'm going to jump on to uh, verse 53 through to the end of the chapter. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, confront Jerusalem with her detestable practices and say, This is what the sovereign Lord says to Jerusalem. Your ancestry and birth were in the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. On the day that you were born, your cord was not cut. You were not washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloths. No one looked on you with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field. For on the day you were born you were despised. And then I passed by and saw you kicking about in your blood. And as you lay there in your blood, I said to you, live. I made you grow like a plant of the field. You grew and developed and entered puberty. Your breasts had formed and your hair had grown, yet you were stark naked. And later I passed by, and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread a corner of my garment over you and covered your naked body. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Sovereign Lord, and you became mine. I bathed you with water and washed the blood from you and put ointments on you. I clothed you with an embroidered dress and put sandals of fine leather on you. I dressed you in fine linen and covered you with costly garments. I adorned you with jewelry. I put bracelets on your arms and a necklace around your neck. And I put a ring on your nose, ear earrings on your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. So you were adorned with gold and silver. Your clothes were of fine linen and costly fabric and embroidered cloth. Your food was honey olive oil and the finest flower. You became very beautiful and rose to be a queen. And your fame spread among the nations on account of your beauty, because the splendor I had given you made your beauty perfect, declares the Sovereign Lord. And then while in these verses the emphasis was on what God had done, I passed by, I passed by, I bathed, I gave you this, I put bracelets, etc. So from verses 15 and following, it's um, flipped over, and it's what Israel did, and it's not good. But you trusted in your beauty. 
Um, you took your sons and daughters and, and sacrificed them. You did this. You did that. You did not remember the days of your youth when I was faithful to you. You, and after that, these words of criticism and judgment and condemnation, hope is once more held out. Verse 53 to the end of the chapter. However, I will restore the fortunes of Sodom and her daughters and of Samaria and her daughters and your fortunes along with them, so that you may bear your disgrace and be ashamed of all you've done in giving them comfort. And your sisters, Sodom with her daughters and Samaria with her daughters, will return to what they were before, and you and your daughters will return to what you were before. You would not even mention your system Sodom in the day of your pride before your wickedness was uncovered. Even so, you are now scorned by the daughters of Edom and all her neighbors and all the daughters of the Philistines, all those around you who despise you. You will bear the consequences of your lewdness and your detestable practices, declares the Lord. But this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will deal with you as you deserve, because you have despised my oath by breaking the covenant. Yet I will remember the covenant I made with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your sisters, both those who are older and, 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 than you and those who are younger. I will give them to you as daughters, but not on the basis of my covenant with you. So I will establish my covenant with you, and you will know that I am the Lord. Then I will make atonement for you for all you have done. You will remember and be ashamed and never again open your mouth because of your humiliation, declares the Sovereign Lord. Amen. Once upon a time, once upon a time is a beginning that tells us that the following story is one that didn't really happen. Some stories are made up to entertain and excite. Some are made up to bring to us a, a message to make a point or two. Some use symbolism and the storytelling to illustrate great truths. Wonderful example of that is the outstanding book, The Pilgrim's Progress, by, by John Bunyan. The various characters and events illustrate truths about the gospel and living the Christian life. And similarly, in Ezekiel chapter 16, there's a telling of a story, not something that took place, but an allegory, a story with symbolic meaning to make its point. Ezekiel and many of his fellow Jews had been forcibly removed from the city of David, from Jerusalem, from the, the temple where their faith was focused. And in chapter 8, Ezekiel was given a vision to make clear that the exile was not because God was caught off guard, not because the Babylonians managed to overcome God, but the exile had happened as God's judgment on his people for their faithlessness. However, the story of God and his people didn't end with the exile. But to see really how that story was to unfold and continue, it's necessary to first take a look back. And that's what the word of the Lord was doing in Ezekiel chapter 16. This is why the word of the Lord came and gave Ezekiel this story. Now, there are lots of stories in the history of the world about the tables being turned, about the poor and destitute becoming uh, rich, about the, the lost cause becoming the hero, and so on. And in this one, a girl is born of, to parents of mixed ethnic background. The child is not wanted or loved. Instead of the usual cleansing and care normally given to the newborn, this child was simply left to die. And still stained with the blood of her birth, her cord uncut, she is abandoned in the countryside where she's unlikely to be found. You know, if a grandparent had a photo of her at this point and showed it to you, you wouldn't be saying, oh, she's cute, oh, she's gorgeous. You'd be saying, how awful. And in that state, a passerby sees the child and moved by love, he commands her to live. 
Later, he passes again, sees that the child has grown, and again shows her love, gives her a place of belonging, gives her clothes and riches, and, and brings out her beauty for the world to see. So the despised newborn, verse 3, is Jerusalem, and the passerby is the Lord, verse 6. And the story emphasizes here the great truth of the gospel that God loves the unlovely. It's a story to emphasize that there's nothing special about those on whom God sets his love. God did not choose the people of Israel because they were better than others. The mixed parentage referenced your um, <clears throat> father an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. That was to underline there was nothing particularly special. There was nothing, no royal blood here or anything like that. And in fact, it was nothing about this child that made her desirable. Nothing she could do or give. Simply, the passerby chose to love. Sometimes people go into relationships for what they can get out of it. You know, um, this person, if I get to know them, they'll be introduced me to so-and-so who I'd like to be with. Or I go into this relationship, maybe have a round of golf with this guy because I want to sell him, you know, several things. Maybe if I can become a friend of so-and-so, I'll get respected and invited to all the, the best events and so on. We do not, we should not respect these motives. Using other people to get what we are after is not good. Pretending that we're a friend when really we're after something is not something that we admire. And then other times we maybe strike up friendships to, that are mutually suitable or beneficial. Um, folks begin to car share on their way to work. Um, a friend that you can go to your favorite theater with or your sporting activities with. Friend because your kids are playing together and you'll be able to do some mutual babysitting and so on. And we don't necessarily calculate who gets the better of the deal. It's something that everyone benefits from. And there's nothing wrong with that. Good. But here in this story, the passerby who picks up the child doesn't do so because there's any advantage in it for him. doesn't even do so because it's for mutual benefit. He, he does it because he's choosing to love the unlovely. There is no waiting for any improvement. There's no instructions for the child to clean herself up first. And in fact, she's unable to do that. Now, this is what the gospel writers mean by grace, the undeserved favor given to the undeserving. There are no strings attached, no price sought. Care and love given to another. God blessing where he's not under any obligation to do so. And if we reflect on that, that, that in fact is a much more secure basis for a relationship. If someone becomes my friend for what I might be able to give or contribute to the friendship, what happens after I've given or contributed it? If it's a relationship where we're each playing our part, what if I fail to keep up what my friend understands to be my side of the deal? If someone chooses to love on the basis of another person's appearance, their attractiveness to you, what happens when they age, fatten, go bald, or whatever? If someone courts another person because they're wealthy, what if the money runs out, and so on and so on. But when the basis of the relationship is grace, then that can never be taken away. Someone loves because they're committed to loving. Someone loves because they choose to love. Someone loves even where it's no particular advantage to them. This is the story of these first verses of Ezekiel 16. If that's the good news, the bad news, verses 15 and following that we didn't read all of, all of um, the bad news is that grace can be rejected. Just as we are familiar with many rags to riches stories, we also know tales where relationships spoil. Someone marries a wealthy public figure, begins to experience and enjoy the bright lights, the glitz and the glamour, and after a while wants more, meets more interesting people, seeks more and different adventures, and then goes behind the spouse's back, cheats and wastes the kindness and generosity spent on them, and so on. 
And so in that second section of chapter 16, the eye of what God has done in the first 14 verses becomes you in verses 15 and following, detailing Israel's unfaithfulness. The word prostitute occurs 21 times in the chapter. That's what's happened. The God has, God has picked up his people. He has rescued them. He has nurtured them. And after they've got a bit older, they've bombed off around the corner, right, left, and center to be with others. The Lord's kindness is wasted. His reputation is trashed. His love is spurned. His grace exploited. And so, thirdly, there is judgment. Firstly, it's unconditional love and grace from God. Secondly, that grace is rejected and wasted. Thirdly, the judgment. And the words of judgment in Ezekiel 16 are not the ranting, vengeful threats of an angry God. They're not a, how dare you do that to me, deity speaking. Rather, it is the pained expression of the jilted lover who still loves, but who is hurting. The rage that characterizes verses 15 to 52 is a rage that is rooted in love. Sin and judgment are not primarily about rules being broken, although that's part of it. It's something worse that's going on. Suppose, for example, someone is caught um, doing 40 miles an hour in a built-up area that should only be a speed limit's 30. And they're caught and they're punished, even if no particular harm was done. The road was quiet, the conditions were good. But nevertheless, they've broken the law, they are stopped, they get fined, and we say, well, fair enough. But we think worse, we feel worse. When the offense is, well, there's a man who in February certainly sent his wife a Valentine card, but he did so even though at the time he was having sex with her sister. And he was making moves at the time on her best friend. Now, no law has been broken. But isn't that kind of behavior worse than the guy getting the speeding ticket? Isn't it the the conscious, deliberate work to do something that you shouldn't? Isn't it the planning and the scheming and the thoughtlessness and everything else that makes that just so much more horrible? The betrayal, the deceit, the undermining scream out to us. And so God should not be seen like the police standing in the roadside with his speed gun and then handing out penalties to anyone who's caught. Rather, he is the one who has so sacrificially, generously, committedly invested himself in a loving relationship with his people, verses 1 to 14. And look what he's got in return. Now, when that happens, when that kind of goodness is is just thrown back in someone's face, could anyone who is really loving say, too bad? You know, you win some, you lose some. No. If that person is loving, they're hurt. And the heart is painful. Now, in one sense, the judgment falls with the withdrawal of God's blessing chapters 8 to 11, the theme that we're looking at last week. But again, it's not God going off in a huffy fit saying, this hurts too much. It's God saying, this is more than I can bear. So the judgment has to be seen in that context. It's the pain of love being flouted. But even though that's the case, and even though the exile is happening, and even though the destruction of Jerusalem is just around the corner. The chapter finishes with promises that God's frustrated love will not always be frustrated, but will become unfrustrated. Punishment and hard times are going to come. So, verse 59, I will deal with you as deserve, 
you deserve because you've despised my oath. But, verse 60, yet I will remember. The punishment, the hard times are not the final word. The passerby taking and nurturing the discarded child was something that came out of the blue that could not have been anticipated, that did not have any human cause, that did not come from any worthiness in the child. And similarly, the restoration that's spoken of in these final verses of the chapter isn't because Israel and the others suddenly came to their senses and put God first. Again, it is God who moved first. It is God who still loves, and He hasn't stopped loving. And his final word is not going to be condemnation, but salvation for his people. Now, that didn't mean, as I said, that the exile wasn't going to happen. It didn't mean that the destruction of the temple would not take place. It didn't mean that the the monarchy would would survive in, in Israel and Judah. It didn't mean that the exile would be over in five minutes. But it did mean that the Lord's ultimate purposes for Israel and the nations would be fulfilled. The Lord had plans beyond that present crisis, plans that spoke of a restoration as unexpected as it was undeserved. Because God will remember His promises, verse 60. He will remember His purposes even if we forget. Surprisingly, the, or it would be for the people of Israel and Judah, Surprisingly, the restoration was going to be shared with Samaria and Sodom. And in fact, in verse 53 and then again in verse 55, the the promise is of Sodom and Samaria being restored first. I will restore the fortunes of Sodom and her daughters and of Samaria and her daughters. Oh, and your fortunes along with them. And then verse 55, and your sister Sodom with her daughters and Samaria with her daughters will return to what they were before. Oh yeah, and by the way, you and your daughters will return to what you were before. It's almost as if Israel was a bit of a thrown on, as an afterthought there. Oh, that would really have bugged the Jews. You see, because when they had the temple, when they were in Jerusalem, and they, they were thinking they were God's special people. They were the bees and knees. Look at, look at what Solomon had given them. This was the city of David. This was the temple. And these smelly Samaritans and Sodomites wouldn't get near this. But you see, grace does not allow us to look down on others. Grace does not allow any place for self-congratulation. That was a message that Jesus had a hard time getting across to the religious folk of his day. They thought there should be and that there, there was some kind of pecking order as to who God should be interested in. They were wrong. And getting that wrong end of the stick was not something confined to Ezekiel's time, not confined to Jesus' time. This series from Ezekiel is opposite for us today because it holds a mirror, an unwelcome and uncomfortable mirror up to today's church. We might think of judgment as something that falls on other people, on criminals, on atheists and the like. But Ezekiel's message is first and foremost a message to Jerusalem, to the church of his day. God had given her the opportunity to be the envy of the world. He had showered his grace on her, verses 1 to 14. But she turned her back. Now, do you suppose that God is any more pleased with the church in lands like ours Lands that have got a long Christian heritage. Are we the kind of people that God is likely to revive and bless? We're a church hopelessly compromised by the spirit of the age. A church that demands healing far more than it is prepared to endure suffering. A church that wants prosperity far more than it's ready ready to face adversity. A church more interested in its cozy get-togethers than in going into all the world. A church more focused on the likes of us rather than welcoming the stranger and those left out. 
Ezekiel was being accused by the exiles that it was God who had betrayed the trust. They thought they were being humiliated and shamed because God had let them down. Just like many in our day and age say God's let the church down. God's not bothered with us. But, says Ezekiel time and again, you are the ones who failed, who betrayed the Lord, turning your backs, presuming on his goodness, thinking that he should be dancing to our tune. And if and when, verse 63, we get to the point of understanding, we'll be ashamed. Then when I make atonement for you all, for you, for all, sorry, <clears throat> then when I make atonement for you, for all you have done, you will remember and be ashamed and never again open your mouth because of your humiliation, declares the sovereign Lord. When we are gripped by grace, when we realize this is grace, this is undeserved favor, then not only do we not have any grounds for looking down on others and judging others, we have nothing to say by way of self-congratulation. We have nothing to say except, I'm sorry this took me so long. I'm sorry I stayed so far, long in the far-off land. And of all the responses that I have heard and I still hear about the church's predicament today, Shame and repentance is not one I hear. And yet, I think Ezekiel, I think the Scripture is saying to us that this is what God is looking for. Not because He wants to leave us, but rather... It is that point at which we realize we have nothing to say for ourselves. It is that point that we realize that we should only be ashamed before the kind of love that God has for us. It is at that point that our healing begins. It is at that point that we can think about and talk about and look for restoration. Verses 1 to 14 are a great picture of how much God loves. And a God who loves like that doesn't forget that he loves. He will remember his promises, his covenant, verse 60, and will work with us, verse 63, until we remember as well. Let us pray. Lord, sometimes the reputation the church has for a holier-than-thou attitude, sometimes that reputation is something we've brought on ourselves. Sometimes that reputation for being concerned with rules before relationships, with duty before grace, is something that we've brought on ourselves. Lord, through your Spirit work in us and, and, and help us to deal with all self-righteousness Help us to throw ourselves entirely on your grace and goodness. That, Lord, once more, the honor and glory of God might be seen in our world today. Amen. A hymn that describes how we bring nothing as we come to God. We contribute nothing to salvation except the sin that makes it necessary. Rock of Ages, cleft for me.
And after we sung the hymn, we will confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Our prayers for others, let us pray. Lord God, we live in an era, in an age of the, the quick, the instant this, the instant that, the soundbite culture. We live in an era of making your minds up quickly and judgment being something you reach immediately. But Lord, you are different from that. You are a God of the binding promise, a God who has made covenant with those you have called. And you're a God who has pledged a future beyond our imagining, not because we deserve, but in fact, in spite of the fact we don't deserve. It's an amazing love. It's an outstanding love. It's words fail us to say how wonderful your grace is. And yet, gracious God, even though you have set such a way, such a standard before us, there are many in our world today who are receiving otherwise from people. And so we pray for those today who have been let down. People who maybe passed on information that wasn't to go further. People who maybe were to turn up and the other person wasn't there. People who are discovering others being unfaithful in relationships. 
people who've been tricked into buying something. Lord, in so many ways, uh, folk in our day and age are let down by others. And we pray that where possible that some recompense, some justice might be won. But also we pray for those feeling let down that they will not be overcome by bitterness, how that won't help them. And while, Lord, forgiveness is not cheap, might they through you find that forgiveness is meaningful and healing. Lord, we pray for those who made pledges, who made promises, and did so with absolutely no intention of keeping them. We pray for those who made something known, but then have decided not to stick by it. They're not to be held accountable to it. Sometimes that happens in our personal lives. Sometimes that happens with individuals. Sometimes, Lord, it even happens with groups of folks and even nations trying to redraw and redesign boundaries despite what they've said, despite what they've signed. And we pray that you will convict those who um, think that honesty doesn't matter. Convict those who think that integrity is not important. We pray that they'll have sleepless nights and worse Lord, bring them to a point of seeing how unfair, how unworthy, how cruel is that kind of outlook. And Lord, we pray that you help us to live up to the promises that we make, the offers that we give. Help us to be people of our word, people of integrity. Help us to be known to be a people with consistency. God, you reach down in love and your love has connected earth with heaven, brought salvation into everyday realities. And we, th we pray for your church to experience more of your love and grace. We pray for those who have lost their first love and lost the excitement of, of faith in Christ. We pray for those who are unable to see beyond the material things of life and are missing out on grace that you're offering. We pray for those who have settled for cheap presumption rather than rich grace. And we pray that you will help your church to be agents, to be vehicles of grace, showing the touch and the love of God, especially taking risks and especially go going where it hurts and where it costs, because that's what grace does. That's what you do. And we thank and praise you that you are a God who has not been slow to speak, but who has shared and made yourself known we thank you for our scriptures. We thank you for those who work with scripture, who help with notes and, and many other ways to make your message um, more relevant to us. And we pray for those who support through their prayer, support us through their prayers too. We give thanks for them. We pray for those whose faith has been dulled because they don't really expect you to turn up. They don't expect you to speak from the pages of Scripture. They don't expect you to touch life. Lord, might something shake them out of such dullness. Might something awaken in them a faith and an expectation that the living God is with us and for us. 
So gracious God, God of the binding promise, God whose love connects us with heaven, God who, who is not slow to speak but makes yourself known. May your grace expand. May your grace expand, not in the sense that it can get, be bigger, that it can't get any bigger, but in the sense that your people might make that grace more real, more better known in our world today. Amen. In a moment, a closing hymn, All I Once Held Dear, which speaks of that value of our relationship with the living God as being the, the key thing. Just before we um, <clears throat> sing uh, that hymn, um, reminder that there was a, a Clement calling out, out this week on an important work about Bible Alive being, being shared in that. And also to say that we received sad news that one of our members, May Crombie of uh, Glenmore, um, died last weekend. Um, at the time of recording this service, we still do not have the funeral details, but we will try to make them available and known as soon as we have them. We do commend Alan, her son, and the wider family to your prayers. All I once held dear.